aboard. Hey, what's up, everybody? You're listening to Cannabis Karaoke, where we ask you to grab the mic and tell your story. Get inside info from today's most interesting cannabis pioneers, and from the first note to the end of the song, listen up as you get to hear the stories of success on Cannabis Karaoke. Welcome back to another episode of Cannabis Karaoke. As per usual, I have a co-host on this one. Um, not totally stoked about it, but um, you know it is what it is in this day and age. You just kind of have to sometimes work with people that sometimes you get along with, sometimes you don't. Um, so I want to welcome Mark Reitman to the show. He's going to be uh, helping us interview our next guest. And uh, you know, like we have been trying to do on a daily basis right now, as we stick through this isolation period and COVID nineteen and you know, watching graphs look like hockey sticks. I wish my revenue and my salary looked like that right now, but not so much. Anyhow, I uh, want to welcome Eric Rosen to the show. He is a the head of direct-to-farm sales for Dark Heart Nurseries. And in my mind, I'm going to proclaim him to be an expert in straniology. Uh, we've had the benefit of knowing each other for a little bit. And from the minute I met Eric, it was all about uh, different strains and his Neville, the the plant that he was growing, and like he would constantly show me photos, like more than he would show me the photos of his kids. And so this guy's a dedicated <laughs> straniologist, and really, really has I feel landed in the place that his skill set can be the most exploited. So welcome to the show, Eric. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time right now. Yeah, hundred percent. Thanks so much for having me on. So let's talk a little bit about um, you know Dark Heart is one of the more renowned. Um, companies that's pr- that provides you know the different uh clones seedlings to the to companies that are growing cannabis on a manufacturing level um let's talk a little bit about their value and and how you ended up there and and you know is it your dream job like you always expected i assume it is so i hope i'm not teeing you up to say bad things but um i i think you are where you need to be you found your home yeah, I think you hit it on the head. This is a perfect example of the universe conspiring to put the right person in the right place at the right time, doing the right, doing the right thing. And I, I say that because I've been, as you know, I've been about cannabis from, you know, I don't want to use, use the term connoisseur because it has some connotations attached to it. So I'll say I've been uh, incredibly fascinated with an unquenchable thirst for knowledge about cannabis since I was 15. Um, my friends and I at the time read The Emperor Wears No Clothes. And as boisterous teenagers, we realized that, you know, everything the government tells you isn't always, isn't always true. So we, two things happened at the same time. We started going to hemp rallies, and we also got spoiled on really, really, really high-quality cannabis at the time because my buddy's older brother was growing some Scentsy Seeds uh, cannabis cup winners at the time in the mid-'90s. So some examples of those are Northern Lights 5 Haze, Silver Pearl, Hawaiian Indica, Skunk One. A lot of what are now known as heirloom strains, and really the staple heirloom strains that were the first thing to hit after the the great land race collection that happened in the in the 60s and 70s. So my life went down the normal route. I you know, got my MBA from you know, USC, worked at Omnicom and Adobe, and at the same time was watching the cannabis industry just blow up. And so finally got to a point where my wife said, it's time for you to go do what you were meant to do. And uh, I was a, a publisher first, and then I went to a technology company. And then uh, now, I, and I said after the last gig, I've got to be working for a plant testing company. So that could have been a flower company. It could have been, it could have been a farm. Uh, to, to be working at, a, at an organization that specializes in making farmers' lives easier um, and also is a genetics company and has a breeding component to it. It's really a dream come true for, for me. Um, I get to get to work with people who love cannabis, who grow cannabis um, externally and internally. You know, Dark Heart is as much a set of plant geeks as we are cannabis enthusiasts. So mm-hmm. every, every question I could possibly come up with, there's a subject matter expert somewhere in the company that can not just answer it, but geek out with me and, and have fun at the same time. So that whole, you don't know, you're doing the right thing when you don't know whether you're working or playing, that whole phrase, I've never experienced it before, except for except for here. And I wouldn't, you couldn't pay me any amount of money to be anywhere else right now. That's great. Sometimes things just line up for you, you know? Yeah, man. It's, uh, look, everything happens for a reason, and you know, one door closes, another opens, and it's uh, it's fun. You know, we've we're watching cannabis grow up as an industry 
and where dark art fits into that mix is that we've always existed to make the lives of cannabis farmers easier. And so what that looks like for, for myself personally is really consulting with, with, with gardens down in Southern California, most of which are indoor. And when you're indoors, you've got limited canopy space. And so the question is, what are you going to do with that canopy? Are you going to flower up part of it? Are you going to have your own mother and cloning scenario? Or are you going to elect to use every single square foot in there for a maximum profit margin, which is flowering cannabis products, right? So flowering cannabis is, is more profitable than cannabis that's in a, a vegetative state. So there's that piece. And there's also the tissue culture side of our business. So we're a plant biosciences company as well. So for, for folks that do want to have a, a, a mother mother situation in mother stock, we will take uh, tissue culture samples to help rejuvenate genetics. Sometimes things go wayward. There's pathogens that get um, infected into the plants that are systemic and you can't, you can't get out unless you take a very, very small cluster of cells and stick them into tissue culture and effectively hit the, it's a genetic reset button to take the plant as close back to its original state as it was in the, in the first place. And then also to keep it there for you in, it's an affected genetic storage locker. So we all, all three of us back up our phones, we back up our computers and laptops and tablets. That's data backup. And you do that because it's a disaster recovery you know, setup. In case of you know, emergency, you have all your data backed up. This is the wow, same thing, but for genetic, genetic data. So are you saying that you could actually, like say somebody's got a mother plant that they've actually been pulling off of and it seems to be sort of whittling down or losing its, you know, its, its pungentness or, or its vibrancy, you can actually take that and sort of reload it? Yeah, ab- absolutely. <clears throat> and it happens at really two, two different phases. One is where, you know, it's, uh, there's something like powdery mildew that, you know, is something that's systemic that you can't get rid of. And then there's deeper infections like the hop latent viroid, which is one of the biggest causes of what's known as dudding, where the plant will start to grow a little bit differently and it, it doesn't yield quite as well. THC percentage can go down. The yield can actually get impacted up to like 30, 30%. So regardless of what you're dealing with, um, when plants go wayward, so to speak, um, you can effectively take it back to its original form like you described. Wow. So if let's just say you have a plant, though, you take it back to its original form. Can you also then like put it on steroids at the same time? Uh, the best way to put a plant on steroids is to start with the right genetics to be <laughs> start with the right genetics to begin with. Copy that. You got to forgive Mark. He's still smoking miracle Grow. <laughs> <laughs> it's like hamburger helper. What are you talking about? <laughs> hey, Eric, funny. do me a favor. Um, you know, sure. you've thrown out a bunch of terms that I'm not so certain most people get. Um, I think, sure. I think, uh, you know, again, we talked a little bit offline and, and I'm, I don't care. I'll say it, you know, h- half or better, more than half of the industry, just white labels, uh, certain strains. And, you know, I, I really feel like the next iteration of cannabis education and, and really people that are I mean, connoisseur is a tough word because it, it provides this like elite view, which is not really sure. what I'm trying to accomplish right now, but to explain to people, you know, the importance of land race strains, um, the importance of plant biosciences, a little bit about, you know, we've all tried to grow, like at least most of the people in the cannabis space, minus the finance people that are in just for the money. Um, we've all done the, like, what's this, you know, what's, I mean, there's terms that are coming out like, like dudding, like I'm, you know, it's, I'm familiar with it, but a lot of people may not understand and, and really capture the full complexity of it's more than just, you know, if I had a nickel for every person that called me up and said, Hey, come check out my home grow and like, look what I'm doing. And, and I'm just thinking, man, you're going to, you're going to lose a lot of money right here. Um, Explain like the, you know, kind of what your company does and what those terms mean. What does land race mean? What does heirloom mean? Um, What is powdery mildew and why does it happen? Give a little bit of a background, a little education for people that are listening. Yeah, sure. So I'll put from a history lesson standpoint, there were there were a number of growers and slash breeders in the we'll call it the late 60s, early 70s, even through the, the late 70s that traveled around the world and collected seeds. And this is important because there are strains that grow with indigenously natively to certain parts of the world, just like um, just like every other animal plant, you know, living creature on the face of the planet. There's there's, there's, there's biological entities that are just native to certain parts of the world. 
So what you'll find is that strains that grow in Thailand, for example, you get, you get wonderful sativas that grow very, very tall, um, that have an extraordinarily cerebral effect in terms of how they make you feel. It's much more in the head than the body. But from a, from a profitability standpoint and an, an efficiency standpoint, they take forever to finish. What that means is the flowering cycle is very, very long, like up, you know, 16 to 20 weeks in some cases which for commercial growers is not ideal, right? So what these breeders did was take, this is just one example, but take a strain like a sativa um, tie stick, for example, and then bring that back and breed it with something from a totally different part of the world that grows and looks and feels totally different. So we're gonna use an Afghani indica as an example. So in contrast to sativas, which grow very large and sparse and take over and don't yield very well per square foot and also take forever to finish. Afghani indicas are very short, very stout, have very dense buds, uh, are very resinous and also finish the flowering, you know, you know, in about half the, half the time. So breeders started doing this from around the world with these indigenous strains known as land race strains. And then those were known as the first version of hybrid strains that we, that we saw. And a lot of this was done in Northern California, you know, Santa Cruz all the way up to, Humboldt and Mendocino. And um, those are now categorized. Those first uh, post land race strains are now categorized for what is what's known as heirloom strains. And this is really what put cannabis on the map from a, from a product marketing standpoint. You know, there was, th this is when you know, cannabis cups started to come into play and strains started to have um, different names and or crosses attached to it. So like Northern Lights number five times or crossed with haze is another example of a sativa and indica cross to get the best of both worlds where haze is growing 20 feet tall northern lights grows very short you put them together and you get something that's wonderful specifically for indoor cultivation and so the second part of the history lesson is you have to remember things were totally illegal back then so and still are in some parts of the country so growers uh, need things that finish fast they can squeeze extra cycles in per year meaning how many different flowering cycles can they, can they squeeze into a 12-month period what can the yield be within each one of those cycles um, and the highest THC percentage possible and also bag appeal. So if you think about it from a selection standpoint, there's artificial selection, there's natural selection. Natural selection is just the, the variation that exists out in the world um, on its own. Artificial selection is like what we've done with dogs. You've got a Labrador retriever that has been the culmination of specifically selecting for various traits and attributes over and over and over and over again until you don't have a wolf anymore you've got a you've got a labrador so this is the same thing but with plants with with cannabis so um the one of the big distinctions between the older strains and the newer strains is that newer strains will definitely peak higher on the thc percentage front because that's what they've been bred for it's what is exciting to consumers that think more is better um what's what i find most enjoyable are actually the older strains because when you artificially select for any number of variables and you do that repeatedly, you're by accident, you're going to inadvertently breed out other traits and characteristics. And in this case, you know, like cannabinoids and plenty of interesting chemical compounds that in my opinion, make for a much richer experience when ingesting cannabis um, than a lot of the newer strains today, which is one of the reasons I'm so excited about this renaissance of, of older classic strains that, legalization and also social media is bringing about yeah when we were younger what are some of those strains sorry go ahead mark what are some of those strains that are coming back yeah so um i'll share what i've got going this year in my own personal garden so i've got i've got skunk one uh which is a arguably the very first ibl um an inbred inbred line and that means that it's stable that you can you can cross you can cross it with itself and the progeny is effectively going to be identical to, to one another. Um, super excited about skunk one. That's in basically everything in the market today in some way, shape or form. Um, I've got silver pearl, which is, what is it? It's um, early girl crossed with uh, Northern Lights. Number five, and I think skunk one is the third in it. Um, also, I've got something called Charlotte's Gift, which is a very high CBD, low THC. Uh, strand that I'm growing for a family member that has an autoimmune condition, so the CBD will 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 help in uh, in that capacity for for her. Um, I'm also growing something called the cough, 
It's a it's a specific phenotype of the. I think this particular strain won more cannabis cups than any other strain in the entire '90s. But Northern Life Number no. Five crossed with crossed with Hayes. That was that's arguably the very first uh, pinnacle hybrid that was ever created and put out to put out to market. Um, on top of that, also Original Hayes, which is a throughway Colombian cross, is going to be one of the one of the last slots in my in my garden. So really, nothing that's been. I mean, all all of these are 20 and 30 years 20 and 30 years old. I figure if I can buy it in a dispensary today, why, why waste a precious slot out of the six that I can legally grow at home for my own personal garden? I feel like I'm in science class. <laughs> I'm trying to take notes, and you're talking crisscrossing, and you're talking phenotypes, and you're talking, you know, uh, I don't think people realize, <clears throat> you know, you guys are kind of the mad scientist, if you will, of the space. It's one of those things where without Darkheart, without a guy like Eric Rosen, um, weed gets kind of boring because, you know, unfortunately sometimes, not all farmers, but a lot of farmers will grow what's being asked, right? And unfortunately we get into trends. Like, you know, the East Coast was always well known for its diesel and the Bay Area was always known for its Kush. And, you know, it was, it you know, Champelli... Sure. Um, by the way, I'm interviewing Champelli here in the next couple of weeks, so I'm pretty excited about that. But, you know, there's there's a, there's a lot of things like, and I hate to sound like an old guy, but there's a lot of things those young kids don't realize about weed, you know? <laughs> and, you know, the whole, like I was saying earlier, you know, um, I have friends that have seeds in the Amsterdam bank. I mean, that was always the holy mecca, if you will, of cannabis sure. was if you were able to go to Amsterdam and – and smoking back in the day, you know, we, we went off nose, we went off nose. And unfortunately what we didn't realize back then is the things that smelled good and we did well with were, were what our bodies were programmed to receive. Um, when you guys are focusing on, it sounds like you guys are really doing some amazing work around taking these land race strains, these heirloom strains and these, uh, you know, pure hybrids to, to make it the best that it can be. I mean, dark art definitely has that reputation. Um, if you, if you are in the space and you understand the game, um, when you can purchase a dark art, um, product that came from you guys, it's pretty, you know, you're buying like the upper stuff. Uh, talk to me a little bit about how dark art had to kind of stick to its guns around being focused on not just passing through whatever came their way. I mean, they've, they've, they're well renowned for being stringent on what they produce, how they produce it. And I feel like they're one of those companies that if, if something hit the fan, they wouldn't fake the funk. They would just take the L and move forward and rebuild. Am I right on that? Or. Yeah, I think you're right on all those fronts. And by the way, thank you for the, thank you for the kind words on behalf of the company. Um, it, we, we do take pride in the fact that, you know, if we mess up, we take ownership over it. And that's at a personal level within the company, as well as, as well as as an organization level, um, as an as an enterprise, and I, I would say the menu that we have is comprised of, you know, what we know people want, and also like a great example is Romulan. You know, we had the the Romulan guys approach us from Romulan Genetics, and they were so insistent and passionate about getting us to pick up their their Romulan cut that, and this is before my time, but we did, we did, and you know that was a, that was a that was a breeder driven demand that you know that he honey badgered his way in and now we've got an amazing cut of Romulan that anyone can anyone can grow. Um you know we've got we've got you know we've got classic like Blue Dream with the Santa Cruz cut of Blue Dream. We've got Sour Diesel, SFEOG. We've also got newer newer things that are coming out of um out of the out of the market like you know the bling and vanilla frosting from uh you know Humble Seed Company. Um, wedding cake and purple punch and things that are you know very common in LA from a market demand standpoint are, are cultivars that we carry. Um, you know what's funny though is I, I talk to gardeners, farmers uh, all the time, cultivation experts all the time, and especially in LA, you know, these trends come and go, right? It's LA is a little bit like LA is fashion city, right? Everything's like fashion here, including cannabis. So right now everyone wants the cookies, the cakes, the mints, you know the the the, the like and gelatos uh, yeah yeah at, at the girl scout cookies and the gelatos all of these all of these you know, but the funny thing is at the same time every grower that i've talked to maybe not everyone but people are 
we want the gas. Give us the gas. We want yeah. that gassy nose. It's that nose, and so man. What they're, yeah, 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 so there's two things, right? Number one is, to your point earlier, follow your nose. Like, your nose will tell you what's good, what's good for you, and what you like. And that's going to be true regardless of how many degrees of you know, analysis you do in a laboratory, right? Your nose will always tell you exactly you know, what, what, uh, what, what's going on. The second thing is that when they say gas, what are they talking about? <laughs> They're talking about OG Kush. And that could be SFVOG, that could be, um, the, you know, Larry's OG. There's, there's so many different, there's, there's so many different varietals that are really just OG Kush and they're slightly different phenotypes, um, but they're really the same, same strain. So what's funny to me is how something like OG Kush, you can call it whatever you want, but that's never gone out of style. And I think it's because of the nose. It just smells, you can smell Kush a mile away and not all strains, taste the same way as they smell, right? Like sometimes you, you, you smell something and you say, that's amazing. You smoke it or you vape it and it doesn't, it, it's a little bit nondescript, a little bit bland or just like general cannabis. My um, neighbor, my neighbor grows and he does a Tahoe bucket one mixed with the candy land, calls it the nine pound hammer. And it's, uh, oh. it's really, really tasty and still has a slight nose. You know, it's not so gassy that you like have to clear the room. Um, but sure. it's definitely got a little gas to it, but at the same time, it's got that Candyland push, which has got a little taste to it. And, uh, man, it's so good. And, uh, you know, he's been, he's one of my friends that has a seed in the seed bank. And while he's not necessarily a licensed grower, he's probably, sure. you guys, I need to introduce you to, because he's, he's one of those guys that starts talking all this stuff. And, you know, not that I'm not well-versed, but, you know, one of the things that I want to ask you, you know, which is something I always ask him is, how do people come up with these names? How do people decide, <laughs> how do people decide how to hybrid? Um, you know, what, what thought process goes into that? Because literally there's like, I don't think the state of California expected there to be, you know, so many different variables categorically, let alone in the flower world. Sure. So the, there's two questions there, right? Let's unpack it. So there's the, how do people decide what to cross together? That's number one. And number two is how do you decide what to name something? So, the crossing piece comes back to selection, right? That comes back to artificial selection and saying, I like this aspect of this plant, of this strain, of this cultivar, and I like that aspect of that strain and that cultivar. So I want to see if I can come up with a, you know, a, a version of cannabis that's a hybrid between the two, and then they, you know, they, they work through the process of making, making that happen, which is really just coming up with the best of both worlds. That's what they're, that's what they're after. From a from a name standpoint, it can either be it can either be a, a combination of those two names put put together like blackjack. Blackjack is black domina crossed with Jack Herrera, so blackjack makes sense. Then people will come up with you know names that are just ridiculous for the sake of getting attention. Um, or I, <laughs> Mark's laughing because he's he's Mark. You know what I'm about to say. The <laughs> the the market the marketing aspect of it. I mean. Mark and I were, have worked together in the past, as you know, Danny, and we were in a dispensary once and they were talking about how they had a certain strain that wasn't moving and they just stuck OG after the, after, you know, at the end of the strain name. And all of a sudden it was selling out like you couldn't believe. So it's, uh, it's funny how names can mean a lot in terms of telling you what something is and they can also mean absolutely nothing. Marketing. Right. Marketing. It's a cross Pro between what's good and what's the marketing potential. Yeah. A hundred, a hundred percent. And we, we were talking today. It's, it's funny you asked me the question about, um, about how we decide what to, what to take on. And look, the NorCal market is different than the SoCal market, you know, and even subdivisions of SoCal, like San Diego servants in, in LA. So we were talking about how to give people what they want, um, meaning take on which cultivars are we going to you know, bring out in the next quarter? But also, how do we how do we embrace being change agents and market makers and helping to turn farmers and gardeners onto strains that they might not automatically think would be you know fun to grow and or and or something that'll sell and fly off the shelves even though even though the genetics of it are you know half or three quarters of something they're already selling that they know works so what I, what we started doing is sending tester packs along with uh, the orders so. Someone will buy you know, a thousand thousand clones or ten thousand teens. A clone is a, a small cutting off a plant that's typically between six inches and four and a half inches. A teen is a little bit larger, about 18, 18 inches tall. 
So we're we're telling the the gardeners and you know, the farmers, take some take some samples of uh, of these other strains, grow them out, see what you think, share them with your customers, and see what the market response is. And then that that's been a natural it's kind of risk free way to to help to help to influence market and consumer trends in ways that's driven by other than just the consumer them, themselves and whatever name is popular. How often do you guys bring a new strain to market? Like how often does that happen? That's a great question, Mark. We've got quarterly strains that come out and those are typically exclusive for, uh, we got two types of people that we work with. There's customers and there's, there's clients that are engaged in more of long-term relationships with us. So typically the quarterly releases that we'll come out with will be reserved for uh, the clients for the first 90 days after they come out for the, for that first quarter post release. And then they'll be made available to anyone else that wants to, wants to pick them up, um, including our dispensary and retail channels. Gotcha. So it's like an exclusive drop to give it time to get to the marketplace and then people can try it. Yeah. Yeah. And it also, it's just another reason for, we're all about long-term partnerships, right? It, it's, it makes, we are part of farmer supply chains. So just like, just like take another industry, for example, everyone works under some type of contract scenario where you're effectively saying we want to partner together and be be part of your business and influence for the positive over the over the long haul versus just a transactional, you know, one and done kind of kind of thing. So the exclusive the exclusive piece is one way that we can help coax what people wouldn't normally do in this industry, which is odd because it's like the standard for the rest of the world in, in business. But then again, cannabis is new. This is a brand new thing for, for, uh, for, for everybody. I mean, even seasoned business people that are coming into the, into the mix are up against the fact that they're working with people that you know might have been in the black market. That you know, that's what they did full time. They didn't go down the potentially the you know the corporate road. And so um, the, I'll tell you a funny story on the, on the side note. I looked at getting into cannabis probably about five years ago. And I went through a very methodical exercise of tracking down about 30 different CEOs and CTOs and CFOs. And back then, it was very easy to get a hold of people. But I asked them all the same set of questions because I wanted a 360 bell curve read on the market to see if it was safe for someone who's married with kids you know, to, to enter the, the, the cannabis space. And I remember having a conversation with someone once, and I asked them, how do you guys deal with contracts, with you know, master services agreements and addendums, just the typical contracts that are from a structure standpoint? And he laughed. He laughed at me. He didn't laugh at me. He laughed with me slash at me. He's like, Eric, it, it, like there, there are no contracts. Like this is a this is a handshake, cash out the back door kind of kind of thing. So uh, now to be dealing with you know the contracts in any way, shape, or form is um, pretty pretty exciting. It's it's exciting to see and be part of uh, the industry growing up. When are we gonna see people shamed for bringing the box weed? like a box wine to the barbecue because Mark does that all the time. Mark shows up with his box weed and I'm like, yo dude, I'm from Santa Cruz. I'm just teasing. Mark actually smokes the crib, but what, when is that going to, when are we going to see? Cause you are right. You know, the, the, we may work for a company that wants us to put a recording device. I'm like, I can't do that, man. Like I talk to people that still do illegal stuff. Like I can't be sure. stealthily recording people on my phone. Um, even though I sometimes do. And so, with regards to like that level of marketing winner, because right now it's like, if you got weed, it's like you got water. Like nobody even questions like the value of it. I mean, and you got Lowell, which is somebody that's like pretty much based their entire existence on like, yeah, we're cheap weed, you know, we're low caliber, low THC, inexpensive sure. cannabis. And I don't want to mean that in a disrespectful way. I just think that there are people that will bring, that will bring box wine to a barbecue and, and be fine with it. They love box wine. Um, how is, how do people take advantage? Cause what, everything you're saying and everything that you're talking about with respect to being part of the farm, you know, chain, uh, supply chain, like I feel like, and I, maybe I'm wrong and I don't want to upset you or disappoint you, but I don't think people even care or realize at the moment, unless they're full on like weed heads. Like, I don't know, not that it's lost on people, but how, how are we connecting the dots, uh, between all this work? And the guy that just decides he's going to do a 20,000 square foot canopy of, you know, blue dream and not really caring sure. where he gets his stuff from or she, sorry. Sure. It's a, that's a great, it's a fantastic question. And you know, the answer is that both are totally okay and expected. Right. So when, when the marketplace matures, the, the place where 
it's federally legal, and you can import and export it just like you can coffee. I think we're going to see the market split uh, to, into – it's going to bifurcate into, you know, for lack of a better term, Budweiser Bud, and then you're going to have craft cannabis. And craft cannabis will be you know, grown domestically, and you're going to have – you're going to go with the equatorial band, to, just like coffee. Coffee's grown in the, in the South America, the equatorial band. Energy's cheap, labor's cheap, the sun's there. You know, that's the, that's, that's the most cost-effective way to, to grow coffee, and cannabis, I think, will follow, follow suit. Um, from a brand standpoint, I mean, we're talking about product marketing and you know, tier, AAA tier brands versus, uh, you know, versus – Ones that are ones that are more long lines of shopping. But, it, but even the AAA, not to cut you off, but even the AAA tier sure. brands sometimes don't pay attention to detail. I guess my question to not to think that you're not answering it, but my question is more like, what is there a like a special marking people can use when they're using Dark Hearts stuff? Is there how do you tr- how do you communicate that to the customer so that they can? I mean. Are you metric based? Does like stuff go all the way back to the seed? Like, what? How do you inform or educate the consumer? Because I think people are still heavily influenced by the, like you said, just slap the OG at the end of it, and that's about the end of their education. Yeah, sure. So, with respect to consumers, so talking about our retail, our retail channel and channel strategy for for a minute, we're pretty selective about who we will allow to resell dark heart clones. And it's for a couple of reasons. One is that we don't want to have, you know, we, we don't want to cannibalize sales by, by you know, oversaturating the, the market. Uh, but equally, if not more importantly, you have to take care of these things. It's not like a product that sits on shelf. You have to have staff that, that cares, that will tend to the, 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 the clones that are in the, in the shop, and also folks that can speak about them and answer questions. And you walk into, think about when we walk into Best Buy, we ask the, you know, the blue shirt that works there, every question under the sun, and it's almost stumped the, stumped the blue shirt because we've already done research on, on everything on CNET and online. This is worlds away from that. You have people coming in that know nothing and that you know are asking every question under the under the sun. So we've got we've got uh, sales enablement specialists that really work with those bud tenders to be able to make sure that they're well informed, knowledgeable, and able to help field questions and also guide customers towards what what's what what a best strain for them is gonna. Is going to be, and through that type of experience, Dark Hearts brand equity gets built and preserved at the consumer level. The same way you were describing us as being a top tier provider of of clones, best in class, bar none, at the enterprise and B two B level. So when you say you're educating the bud tenders on your bud, so is this from uh, the ability for consumers to purchase this, or is this for the bud tenders to talk about? The, the strains that have already come in, been cured, been packaged up and sold to the consumer? Or is there a place for both of those things to exist? Yeah, sure. So the consumer, if they're buying flour that was grown from a dark heart clone further up the supply chain stream, is not necessarily going to know that it came from that it came from us. Uh, when when farms source their clones from us, the flour is going to be is going to be top tier. But it's the brand at that point that's going to have that level of brand brand equity. What, what I'm describing is dispensaries that are selling clones directly to consumers. And those clones do come in branded dark heart, dark heart pots. And consumers have questions about which strain should I get? I see that you have rock wool and also soil, which is the best way to go. And how do I care for the plants? And how do you know when to trim it and take it and dry it and cut it? And every, every question under the, under, under, under the sun. And believe it or not, guys, I know this is going to come as a big surprise, but there is no examination for bud tenders to take. There's no bud tender test. No, that. you're kidding me. <laughs> Wait, you mean what? No way. The prerequisite. The prerequisite bar is relatively low, and that will change too, right? That will that will change too, and that will change as a function of the market becoming more sophisticated, for the base level of consumer knowledge to start to rise, and the expectation will be that bud tenders will have some some baseline level of knowledge um, that has not been required in the past. I have a story. I was in a sure. sh- I was in a shop, um, like I usually am, and we were doing some things with the television. And a person walked in, and they started asking some vape questions. And you know, it reminds me of having my surf shop back in the day. You know, I'd have these surfers, and I had to hire surfers because you know sure. they they lived, eat, and slept it, and so they were inherently intelligent at times. And 
I was so you have to hire stoners most of the time to be bud tenders because they have to be okay with being around weed. They have to kind of have some knowledge. But I and this is just a one story, but it's like replicable across any dispensary I, I've walked into. And there's a few rare ones that the bud tenders are actually educated. Shout out to Jeremy Abrams and you know R.I.P. One Love. But um, the this guy was like asking questions and and the dude finally looks at him, the bud tender, and he's super high. And he's just all, bro, I don't, I don't even, I just dab. I don't vape. I don't smoke weed. <laughs> I only know how to dab. And he's literally the only, I got down off the ladder. I walked the guy through like all the different questions he had. He wanted to have an indica pin and a sativa pin. Long story short, I made a $250 sale for the dispensary. But nice. that happens so many times. And it's one of those things that, you know, these guys aren't getting paid like minimum wage most of the time either. It's, it's. Bud tenders are in short supply, believe it or not. And so to get a good one, whew, you might be paying that person 40 or 50 grand a year just to be a bud tender if they're a good one. You know, now that's sure. not the case for everybody. And there are bud tenders that make 12 to $14 an hour. That's like going to, uh, I don't know, a Safeway versus going into some more boutique uh, grocery store where you're going to get better service. But, um, is there anything in the works for dark art to focus on doing any of that education um, with bud tenders or, or who do you see out there? That's actually, is there anybody like even taking a shot at it? Sure. So everybody should read, if you're working in a dispensary, everyone should read a book called cannabis pharmacy by Michael, Michael Bax. It's, it's probably one of the single best sources of knowledge about cannabis across the board, including staple strains and things that, you know, customers will ask for ingestion modes and methodologies. But I think that to answer your question, I think that what we'll see in cannabis is going to be exactly the same as what we see in say consumer electronics, for example. Um, and I, I know this only because I spent five years playing in that, playing in that field. And that's that the people that care most about product training are going to be the brands, not the, not the retailers. The retailers don't care if you're selling TVs. They don't care if you sell 10 more Samsungs or 10 more Sonys as long as you sell 30 more overall TVs in that same time period. So from a brand standpoint, the retailers are relatively brand agnostic. They want to see quantity and they want to see they want to see dollars. And so what that means is that brands like Sony or Panasonic, and, and whoever it is, will they will pay. They will pay a pretty penny to have people go in and do brand ambassador days. So the, the concept of a, it's a patient appreciation days, you know, customer appreciation days, these types of uh, brand ambassador sponsored um, tabletop events inside dispensaries, I think are going to become more and more prevalent. And not, are, not only are they going to become more prevalent, the retailer, meaning the dispensary will start to charge them for the ability to come in and do that uh, because this is retail, right? I mean, retail is retail is retail. Every single retail environment is exactly the same. Retailer has all the power. It's a it's a real estate play for for shelf space, and you pay for everything as a, as a brand. So dispensaries aren't there yet. Some are. I, I've heard of you know some shops in LA that are that are literally renting out by the square inch for you know what what you get. But I think they're they're in the minority. And over the long haul, it's definitely going to be on the brand shoulders to educate because they want to educate and they want to educate and influence for their brand specifically. So it's in their best interest to own that themselves. Yeah, I just don't see a lot of it <clears throat> happening on the macro level. Um, some dispensaries make a point to really do that, but then it seems like once you educate educate them, then they leave, you know, and they go somewhere else, and then they take that knowledge with them. I, I just I think it's a huge hole in the space right now, and it's a really unfortunate disservice sure. to companies like yourself who are putting out a premium product that you don't have the dispensary bud tender as knowledgeable as possible. Hopefully, as we come out of this. Uh, this little mini pandemic we're having at the moment. Um, oh, God. You know, we'll talk a little bit about how that's impacting you as well. Uh, you know, sure. I think people need to take some time to really to really bone up on that stuff. You know, how how is COVID affecting your day to day business right now? Like, what are you having to change? It's a great question. It's it's hitting everyone, right? I think every single every single industry has been impacted by this in some way shape or form. The good news for cannabis is that we fall under the protected agricultural infrastructure heading. So it's, it's uh, guys, I mean, it's like, it's funny to say, but like, did you ever think you'd see the day where cannabis would be a protected class from an, in, from an industry? I think it was, a, it was an accident, bro. I think it was a hundred percent. They didn't know what decision to make. And 
because they actually shut it down in San Francisco originally. Like cannabis was not sure. going to be listed as an essential product. And then all of a sudden they're like liquor stores. They did all these things. And then the cannabis they they, I don't just like their regulations in the state. God love the state for making an attempt. They don't know what they're doing. And so they're just like, uh, we can't lose the te- It was zero to do about the medicine and a hundred percent about the taxes in my opinion. With the- and that decision, to- that decision, I my guess is that that decision, good, bad, right, or wrong, intentional or by mistake, is going to be a huge source oh. of acceleration for federal legalization oh. because it just got, oh, it just got, it just got the stamp of credibility just got put on it in a totally different way that would never have happened if it wasn't for this this calamity. A hundred percent agree with you. The uh, the way that it's impacted us is, you know, you got people just like in every other industry. You got people that are more or less sensitive to being around other sick people, and you've got people that are potentially immunocompromised. And so, you know, we've we've you know we've had we've had everything from you know being down a driver, you know, one day, or being down a you know a, a worker in in production, who are the lifeblood of our of our of our business. You know, the guys that are taking cuts and prepping the clones. So that's the what we cannot exist without them. So. If you lose even one of those people for a single day, output gets affected, right? And so there's there's that piece. And there's also the retail piece, which is dispensaries of clothes. So dispensary orders that we've you know had, that we've come out with, and it, it, all of a sudden the dispensary is like, ah, we don't need that anymore. The the good thing for us is that we're literally sold out right now through the month of through the month of uh, March. So we I, I couldn't sell clones to you today if you were a, a farm, even if I, even if you wanted to. I, I, I don't have them to sell. So the good news is that the impact of you know, our dispensary channel partners and sometimes canceling orders is that we can then could just repurpose them over to someone else who will gladly, gladly take them. So I, it's, it's hit us. It's definitely hit us. Thank God it hasn't been nearly as bad as I think any of us thought, thought it would be. Yet. How easy is it for like uh, a consumer to try their own hand at growing something? whether they're good or bad at gardening. Sure. So uh, it can be as, you know, as they say, it's, uh, it's easy to grow cannabis. It's hard to grow really, really good cannabis. But to my point earlier about how do you beef up genetics, how do you put them on steroids? It's like start with the right genetics to begin with. So we've actually rolled out um, a new product for people that want to make it as easy as possible. And they're called easy pots. So it's, it's literally what's called an auto flowering feminized seed, which means that you plant the seed, and then two months later, it's going to start flowering and you're going to be done with it in four months, regardless of the light cycle. And so that makes it the, the, what that means for consumers is that it's super easy. You just add water. There's already, there's already fertilizer, fertilizer in there. So if you're, if holiday season's coming up, I mean, I can't think of a better present for parents or you know, in-laws, right? <laughs> but the, if you want to cultivate though, it's not, it's not, it's not complicated. You've got to pick the right genetics have good have good soil um know know how much water to give make sure it's getting enough light and harvest it at the right time and then dry it properly and and make sure that when you put it inside of a jar the humidity is right so that you don't have a mold a mold problem um it can be much more complicated than that if you want to get into the details and nitty-gritty but it's uh it, it's very much within reach of the ad the, the average person nice i can use my miracle grow <laughs> You can stop smoking your miracle grow and you can stop. put it where it belongs, which is in the soil. Sharpen your crayon and take some notes, Mark. <laughs> hey, Eric, last question before we wrap sure. it up. Um, LED versus uh, sodium. Yeah, sure. LEDs have come a long way. They're, they're, they're fantastic. Uh, I don't have a I, – I grow outdoors at, at, uh, at, at home. Um, if and when I get anything indoors, I'm absolutely going to go with LEDs. I think that – no, they're just more they're expensive more expensive up front but they're doing from everything that i'm reading and hearing they're doing just as good of a job as um as as hbs's and the and the like and i think that they're i think that they especially off, because you is can, it because they throw off less heat you think because then it's easier to keep the rh at a at a more stable level or what why do you think leds have because everybody was shitting on them when they first came out and now all of a sudden i'm walking into places that look like vegas you know um, yeah, I, I, it, it's it's almost oppressive how bright how bright they can get. You yeah. really do need you need sunglasses. Um, so 
it's the heat factor. It's that they require a lot less energy and they yeah. last a lot longer factor. And also they're digitally controlled, right? So just like you've got the LED lights at home where you can control it with your smartphone and you've got, you know, you can put a disco party on in your, in your bedroom, you know, if you want with the Philips smart bulb. It's kind of the same thing. And the goal here is to mimic what's coming from the sun. So if you have more granular controls over that by way of digital digital controls and mechanics, uh, you're going to be able to dial that in a lot a lot more. Than, I, I've uh, heard people say process. that their investment into LED has resulted in them saving on tonnage for AC because they don't have – because even though those the sodium lights are good, they put off so much heat, which so causes – which causes the humidity to go up, which then you got to cool the, the place down. And so you're constantly going up and down and, you know, any, any grower, you know, <clears throat> you should be able to ask them two things. And one of them being, what's your average RH, you know, and if they can't answer you or if it's in the wrong range, stay away. Hey, um, right. thanks for the time today, bro. Uh, I really appreciate it. Mark, thanks for jumping on and bringing Eric to the table. Um, always solid to be able to interview someone with you, even though I give you a hard time, you know, it's, we're just kidding around. Um, let us let people know where they can, you know, give us a website, uh, talk to us about your social media and then, uh, we'll wrap it up. Killer. Yeah. Darkheartnursery.com. Uh, social handles also Darkheart nursery for, for all the, all the majors, uh, feel free to add us, follow us. Um, and if you are a, if you're a consumer and you're growing at home and you want to know where and when to get clones, you can sign up for the, the drop announcement via email. And that's on uh, darkheartnursery.com. Mark, do you have anything left for Mr. Uh, Rosen? No, thank you for dropping the knowledge, my man. We appreciate it. Yeah, my Eric. pleasure, guys. Thanks for having me on. Love it. Thanks, Eric. Talk soon. Speak soon. All right. <laughs> That's a wrap. Thank you for listening to this edition of Cannabis Karaoke, another kick-ass podcast about all things cannabis. You can find us on iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, and our website, CannabisKaraoke.tv. And if you or someone you know would like to be on the show, please hit the book your interview button on the right. Cannabis Karaoke, grab the mic and tell your story.